Rich Johnson was a Delaware boy. He uh, was born in Wilmington, but soon at the age of three, he moved to Dover. And his family decided in the mid 20th century, in the 1960s, that it would be nice to have a memorial to him. So that is why this museum was created in 1965. It opened to the public in 1967 to tell his story and to get the message out that this Delaware native invented the spring motor that would take the flat disk machine um, to fruition and make it a, a success. E.R. Johnson, um, as he was growing up here in Dover, um, didn't really do that well in school, he, but he was such a genius that I think when you're young, it's, it's really hard to do well in school and pay attention. And he was actually told uh, growing up that he would not be smart enough to go to college. So instead of trying to make that happen, his parents um, decided to apprentice him to a machinist in uh, Philadelphia. So he did live with, an, live with an aunt up there, and in that process, he learned an awful lot about what it took uh, to have his own business. And eventually, he um, was able to buy a machine shop in Camden, New Jersey. And uh, he went from wire stitching all the way up through um, repairing machines. He got to be very uh, good at, at that trade in particular. And, uh, he was able to meet Emil Berliner along the way, who was, um, had just invented the flat disk machine and had put all of his patents out for that, and, but he couldn't really make it work well. And it was Johnson who actually was asked to um, create a motor that, w that would be reliable, and that's exactly what he did with the spring motor concept. And so uh, in, by 1901, the two men had decided it was time to form a company, and it was called the Victor Talking Machine Company. Early on, uh, Mr. Johnson's machines were referred to simply as talking machines. And these were the ones that had an external horn, as you see here. Basically, they were metal with a brass tip, and of course, they were run by a spring motor, which he invented. Now this particular machine was known as the Victor Monarch Special, and it was built between 1902 and 1905. And it really was quite a deluxe model because of all the hand carving and special effects on the cabin itself. And it would have cost the customer a very high price of nearly $50 in those years, which was an amazing amount of money for that time period. Now what I'd like to play first is a recording by a very, very famous Italian uh, tenor named Enrico Caruso. And this particular recording it was known as O Solo Mio, or My Sunshine. Now I'd like to have the record pick up its full momentum to 78 revolutions per minute, which obviously is why they were referred to as the 78 records. Now in the early days, Mr. Caruso only recorded single face records. In other words, he only had one song on one side. It was not only until after his death in 1921 did they ever record two Caruso songs for the customer. Now keep in mind, an average price of a Caruso record might have been as much as two to three dollars as compared to an average 75 cents. But he was in such high demand that people were very willing to pay it. He was quite the rock star of his time. Again, this is going to be O Solo Mio or My Sunshine.
Now again, that was just a short sample of Mr. Cruz's voice. He was probably obviously the most famous uh, tenor of, his, of, of all time. As a matter of fact, even modern day tenors still use Enrico Caruso as a, a guide for a beautiful voice. Eldridge Johnson was uh, really concerned with the fidelity and he would um, over and over made improvements to um, the way that the, the sound was transmitted through the horn and eventually in uh, 1906 he was able to patent um, the inside horn machine and he called it a Victrola which has uh, kind of become a generic term today. Um, we do get a lot of questions from people and they say oh they've got a Victrola when in reality it could very well be another, another machine made by a company that's not made by Victor. Um, but that was a, a real success um, to put the horn, which kind of had become a, an accessory that a lot of people got tired of, of maneuvering around because it was delicate and, um, and then it was kind of like a magic thing that happened. It, uh, the horn was folded upon itself and kind of sandwiched or stuffed into that little box and that was his major invention, um, I would say, in making this uh, little tiny machine play so well. Mr. Johnson and his engineers went to work to try to keep the customers very happy. And what they did, they came up with a style referred to as a Victrola. Now the word Victrola actually was coined when the horn was actually removed and it was put in, in a concealed area within the cabin itself. Now, they also decided, which was a very clever idea, to put doors on the front, which allowed you to modify the sound. So now you had volume control doors. You also could take the lid and close the lid, which would give you the ability to soften the sounds, but also sometimes if you had a very uh, Record, a scratchy record that would also hide that sound as well. Now this particular machine was called the Victrola Number no. 9. It was built between 1911 and 1926. It has a beautiful uh, sound to it and it would have cost you nearly $50 to even $75. Now the word Victrola actually came from the fact that he used the word Victor, the name of his company, and he added on O-L-A, Victrola, which was done very, very uh, commonly back in that day. A couple other examples would be uh, Crayola, uh, the Motorola Company, the Pianola Company. It was a very, very popular thing to do during that time period. Now as I wind my Victrola, I've decided to play for you a record by a very famous Irish singer of that day named John McCormick. Here's a lovely photo of Mr. McCormick in his younger years. Very, very popular with the, uh, the ladies of that day. <laughs> Beautiful voice. He was very, very well known for his Irish songs, but also he had a beautiful tenor voice. As a matter of fact, he used Caruso as his model. He wanted to be an Irish Caruso, as he once said. And my particular recording that I want to play for you is called When You and I Were Young, Maggie by John McCormick. Again, this is the Victrola 9. Watch the scene feed 
I'm opening and closing the doors to modify the sound for the concealed horn here. And also, I can close the lid to do the, have the same effect. Then I'll reopen the lid, reopen my doors, and you have, of course, extra volume again. And it was also uh, very important to Johnson to bring this uh, new uh, available machine to the masses. He, d he really was very much uh, wanting to make sure that, that music uh, was, was heard by anybody who would like to hear it. So uh, in the ensuing years, uh, he did manufacture machines that were talking machines that were very uh, well priced, so to speak, meaning um, most people could afford them. The machine I'd like to show you now, uh, now that we've seen the other uh, two, was referred to as the Credenza, and it was produced between 1925 and 1928. And what makes this machine so very special was the fact that in 1925, the Victor Company had a big promotion uh, referred to as Victor Day. And on that day, customers were invited to go to the local uh, Victor stores and buy the very first what was known as the orthophonic machine and also orthophonic records. Now these were records that were recorded electrically with the use of a microphone, uh, where earlier records were referred to as acoustic and they were recorded actually inside of a mechanical horn. Uh, the new way of uh, electrically recording provided the ability to record uh, much more of an octave of sound and they sounded much more like a live orchestra. So this was a very exciting day for the Victor Company. Again, in November 1925. Now the Credenza was probably the most famous model of all because, number one, it had the largest horn the company had ever produced. As I open my doors, you're going to see a modern day uh, speaker material, but earlier ones used the louvers. And if I removed the horn from inside and I stretched it out from end to end, it actually measured approximately six feet so it had quite a very, very loud volume. And then as you can see, we still have the doors as the ones I showed you earlier on the Victrola for volume control, okay? Now the name credenza came from the fact that the word credenza, if you look in the dictionary, simply means a large piece of furniture. So that's why they call this the credenza because it looked like a nice piece of uh, furniture in your home. And this was a this is a very very popular machine for collectors. Now, as I wind it up, I'm first going to play a record done acoustically, known as the Light Cavalry Overture Part One, and it was recorded by the Victor Symphony Orchestra. And what I'm going to do is play a sample of this, and then we'll compare it to the same recording done orthophonically. Now you have to get up towards a special momentum of 78 RPMs. I'll lower my needle down to the groove and I'll play a very short sample. Now that was a sample of the recording done again mechanically. Now I'm now going to play a sample of it done electrically. And also on the label, the customer would know that it was done electrically because there would be a VE stamped on the base of the label. Okay. Now these machines would have cost the customer an average of $300, which you can well imagine during that time period 
was quite a lot of money. But this was a very, very popular machine. Now you're going to really notice the difference in the output of this recording. Now again, I'll, I'll close my volume control doors, but also the credenza has something very special. It had room on both sides for storage of your recordings, which was very important for the customer. But this was an extra little uh, perk. You could close the lid and it would close hydraulically. There you go. This was the credenza, again, from 1925 until 1928. And they produced approximately 14,000 of these in those uh, few, few years. Another thing that we do here is talk about the story of Nipper, the, his master's voice dog. And there's all kinds of good, fu funny things to talk about this dog. He was a very clever dog. But um, he uh, arguably has become the symbol for uh, the sound industry in general, um, and everybody recognizes him around the world. And that was Johnson and Berliner's doing to bring him to fruition. Nipper was a real dog. He was a bull terrier, uh, maybe a little fox terrier mixed in. And uh, his owner, Mark Barod, was an artist, and he did scenic um, landscapes. His older brother Francis, however, um, painted. He was so touched by Nipper listening with a puzzled look on his face uh, at some of the music that was being played in his brother's house. So he decided to uh, paint Nipper with his cocked ear, the, the image that we all know so well today. And sure enough, the gramophone company purchased the painting and patented it. And, uh, and then that's when Berliner a little later on, brought it to the United States and, and made that patent over here on the trademark painting. Um, and it became a great success in, in England and in the United States at that time period. And about the same time was when the um, Johnson and um, Berliner collaborated on getting, uh, the, making the improvements for their machine. The Is Master's Voice painting um, even though it started out as being a, a one company um, image with the Victor Talking Machine Company and before that the Gramophone Company in England and America, um, it is spread throughout the world now and, and even though it was um, acquired by RCA once uh, RCA did take over uh, Victor Talking Machine Company, um, it was first purchased in the agreement be between Johnson and RCA in 1927, and it was finally made formal in, in, by 1929. Um, RCA did keep the um, trademark on all of their recordings and their uh, radios uh, because uh, they owned the trademark, and it was recognized and loved around the world by then. So it was a very smart marketing move. And RCA, of course, kept that all the way through um, the, the decades. Uh, people love him around the world, and I think that's what really um, made him a worldwide icon. Well, Mr. Johnson, of course, was a self-made man. And, of course, back in that time period, anyone who did not have the chance to pursue a college career, as he, as he unfortunately was not able to do, it tells a, a really an amazing story how one man that had such fortitude, uh, he was a very brilliant businessman, he was even a more brilliant promoter. Uh, he took a small company and raised it to the highest level, to the point where he had no competition nearly. 
And again, it's, it's the true American success story.